In biochemistry, it's very useful to be able to determine what the sequence of nucleotides in some DNA molecule because if we know what the sequence of nucleotides is, that will give us information about how gene expression takes place and what types of proteins are produced. Now, what's the process by which we can actually sequence our DNA molecule? Well, the process is known as Sanger dideoxy method or simply Sanger DNA sequencing. Now, before we discuss the steps of this process, let's discuss an important molecule used in this process and let's see why it is actually used. So, the molecule is this molecule here. It's called 2 prime, 3 prime dideoxynucleoside triphosphate or simply DDNTP. Now, this molecule is almost identical to a normal deoxynucleoside triphosphate. The only difference is the sugar component contains a 3' carbon that does not contain a hydroxyl group. So, remember, in a normal deoxynucleoside triphosphate, the presence of the hydroxyl group on the 3' carbon allows DNA polymerase to actually form a phosphodiester bond with the next nucleotide in line. So, in the process of DNA synthesis, when we're replicating a DNA strand, the DNA polymerase needs this hydroxyl group to be present on the 3' carbon to actually form the phosphodiester bond. And if that hydroxyl group is not present, as in this case, it will not be able to form that phosphodiester bond and so DNA replication would essentially stop. And so, what this DD NTP molecule is used for in this method is to basically stop the process of DNA replication. And we'll see why that's important towards the end of this lecture. So, let's move on to these four steps. So, in step one of the Sanger DNA sequencing, we have to actually obtain that DNA molecule that we want to sequence. So let's suppose we have a double-stranded DNA molecule as shown on the board. Now, the second step of this process will involve DNA replication. And remember, DNA replication only takes place if the two strands of DNA have separated. So in step one, what we essentially want to do is we want to denature the double helix structure of the DNA. We want to separate the two strands of DNA. And the way that we're going to separate them is by adding sodium hydroxide. So remember a base or an acid, if we mix the DNA in either a basic or acidic solution, in this case a basic, the base will essentially ionize the bases of our DNA molecule and that will disrupt and break the hydrogen bonds. And so if we take the double strand DNA molecule and we add sodium hydroxide, we produce these two individual strands of DNA. Now, one of these single strands of DNA can actually be chosen for the sequencing process. Now, it doesn't matter which one of these DNA strands we choose because if we choose this one, for example, then once we determine the sequence of this DNA strand, we can easily determine what the sequence of the other strand is because these two strands are complementary. They have complementary base pairings. So the G bases with our C and the A bases with our T. So once we know this sequence, we know what the other sequence is simply by the base pairing process. So let's choose this single stranded DNA molecule. We isolate it, we place it into our beaker that contains only this molecule here. And then we move on to step number two. And in step number two, we want to basically replicate this DNA molecule. And so what that means is we need three different things. We need a DNA primer, we need DNA polymerase, and we need the building blocks, the four types of normal deoxynucleoside triphosphate. So in step two, the solution containing the single strand of DNA, this one here, is mixed with number one or A, a labeled, radioactively labeled DNA primer. So we need the DNA primer to basically, uh, for that DNA polymerase to actually 
actually work because remember, the DNA polymerase will only initiate replication if the primer is present. And what that means is we have to know what this initial sequence is on that DNA molecule because to build the DNA primer, we have to know what the complementary sequence is to this group here. So if this is A, C, G, then we have to build a primer that contains the sequence T, G, C. And so we can build that in a laboratory and we also radioactively label that DNA primer because that will basically allow us to pinpoint exactly where that molecule is when we undergo the process of gel electrophoresis. So we add a label DNA primer that is complementary to the three end of that single stranded DNA molecule that we want to sequence. So this is the three end of that DNA molecule. And remember, DNA polymerase reads from three to five and it builds from five to three. And that's why this is the end that we actually want to build the DNA primer for. So we add the DNA polymerase and we also add the four types of deoxynucleoside triphosphate. So we add DATP, uh, DGTP, DCTP, and TTP. And finally, the important component in the Sanger dideoxy method is a tiny amount of one of the four types of DDNTP molecules. Remember, we have four different types that can exist, and that's because we have four different types of bases. So this base could be adenine, it could be guanine, it could be cytosine, or it could be uh, thymine. And so we have four different types of DDNTP molecules. And in step two, we have to add a tiny amount, about 1%, with respect to the other nucleoside triphosphates of a specific dideoxynucleoside triphosphate. So we don't add all four types, we only add one type. Now, why is that important? Well, let's see what that actually does by examining the following diagram. So we essentially take this DNA molecule, the single strand, and we mix it with these four components. So we have the radioactively labeled DNA primer that is complementary to the three end. We have the four types of uh, deoxynucleoside triphosphates, these four ones shown here. We have the DNA polymerase and we have a very small amount, so let's say about 1% of the DDATP. So that's the specific DDNTP that we're going to choose for this specific experiment, for that specific beaker. Now, what will begin to happen? Well, what will happen is the complementary DNA primer will hybridize itself to this section here as shown in the following diagram. So this is our DNA primer. It will form these base pairs as shown in the following diagram. So T base pairs with A, G base pairs with C, and C base pairs with G. And then the DNA polymerase will bind onto the primer and it will use the hydroxyl group on this cytosine to basically form that first phosphodiester bond. And so it will take a thymine, it will take this molecule here to basically form the first base. Then it will move on onto the second base, which is a T, and that will basically form an A. Now we have two types of A's that we can use. One of them is the normal deoxyadenosine triphosphate, the other one is a dideoxyadenosine triphosphate. And the dideoxyadenosine triphosphate does not contain a hydroxyl group on the third prime carbon. And what that means is, if that DNA polymerase actually uses the DDATP to place this base, it will not be able to continue that DNA replication process because that molecule does not have the hydroxyl group that is needed to produce the phosphodiester bond with the next base. And so if this A comes from the DDATP, this process will end and this will be the molecule that we will synthesize. And this is why we have fragment number one, molecule number one. 
Now, because we only have 1% of this DDATP, this DNA polymerase will only sometimes use the DDATP. Usually, it's going to use the normal DATP molecule. And if it uses the normal DATP that contains the hydroxyl, then it will continue synthesizing those phosphodiester bonds. And so, we can produce fragment number two. So if this was normal, then it will continue. So the DNA polymerase would add the thymine, then the guanine, then the cytosine, then the thymine, and now it comes to a T. So that means there is once again the possibility for an A. And the A can either come from this normal DATP or the abnormal DDATP that lacks the hydroxyl. And if it's this, group here, then once again we will stop the synthesis and this fragment will be produced. Now if it wasn't that molecule, then we would add the next, so if the A was normal, the normal DATP, it would produce the next uh, nucleotide in line and so the next one is also an A because this is a T, so once again this is an A. And now we have a possibility between this one or this one and let's suppose it's once again the DDATP and so it will stop it once again after this because it lacks that hydroxyl. And so at the end in our mixture in beaker number one after we conduct step number two with the DDATP these are the, are the three fragments that will be present inside our beaker number one. Now we take that beaker number one and we place it into SDS page. So SDS polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. So this is our setup and we have four different wells. Now well number one we label as the DDATP because this is step two where we used the DDATP. We take the mixture and we place it into well number one, lane number one, and we allow these to separate based on their masses. Remember in gel electrophoresis, the smaller our molecule is, the farther down it will move along that gel. So if this is molecule 1, 2, and 3, this band will be for molecule 1, this band will be for molecule 2, and this band, the highest up, will be the largest molecule, molecule 3. Now we continue the same process three more times. And the second time around, we use a different DDNTP. The third time around, we use yet another DDNTP. And the final fourth time, we use the final DDNTP. So let's suppose the second time around, instead of using the DDATP, we used DDGTP. And so instead of having the fragments where we stop on the A's, we're going to have the fragments where we stop on the G's. And so because we only have two C's. So one, uh, this C doesn't count because it's part of the primer. So we have one C and we have a second C. So the complementary would have a G here and a G here. So we only form two fragments and this lane would contain two bands because we only contain two fragments with different sizes. Then we repeat the process. Instead of using this one, we use DDCTP. So C, that means we have to count up the G's here, not including including this one because it's part of the primer. So we have one G, we have two G's. And that means we're going to have two complementary C's. So we're going to have two different fragments. Once again, one, two. And finally, if we use this one, we have to look for our adenine. So we, um, we have to look for the adenine. So we have one, two, three, and four. We should have four fragments. And that's exactly what we get in this particular case. So Basically, in step three, we take step two and we repeat that same step three different times with the other three DD and TPs. And in step four, once the four reactions are completed, we run gel electrophoresis. Each reaction mixture is placed into a lane, so lane one, lane two, lane three, lane four, and the results are then transferred onto a polymer sheet and then we use x-ray order radiography to basically determine exactly where those radioactively labeled fragments actually were. And so this is the diagram that we get. 
Now, how can we use this to actually determine what the sequence of that initial DNA molecule is? Well, we know what the first three nucleotides are because that's the primer. So we have uh, T, G, and C. So the question is, what are these remaining nucleotides here? Well, let's try to use the following setup to basically determine what the sequence is. So we know that the farther down along our page, the uh, the smaller our fragment is and the closer the nucleotide sequence is to the beginning and the fragment all the way at the bottom basically describes this right over here. So that means the first nucleotide following the primer is the one lowest at the bottom. So this and, and, and according to this uh, graph, according to this um, uh, setup, the lowest one at the bottom corresponds to a T. So this one is a T. The next one is, we have an A. The next one is, so let's make it a little bit bigger. We have a T, we have an A, then we have a T. Next we have a G, next we have a C, next we have a T, then we have two A's, one and two, then we have a T, then we have a G, and then we have a C. And so this is the C 